Oh, thank you. And thank you, Kim, for that warm introduction. It is so good to be with you this weekend, or I should say tonight, because unfortunately I have to head out early tomorrow, but I've been trying to get to this district now. I think this is the third attempt that it finally happened, because Aruna was kind enough a couple years ago to invite me to Mackinac, that's where you had yours, but I had other commitments. Last year, I had an opportunity with Tracy and Bala, and unfortunately, but Russ, we made it happen. Thank you so much to, to be here, to, to be able to see old friends and, and make new ones is, is always a tremendous opportunity. I'd like to take a moment to, to recognize a couple people who do such tremendous work behind the scenes. I know in this district, but specifically in the world that, that I have the very good fortune of being in, and that's our, our zone. Um, we are collectively where we sit in zone 28. I can go through the geography, but I'll get to the end. And I'm from zone 32. And the first person I'd like to recognize is in the back of the room, we have Liz Smith, who is an absolute wizard. For all that she does, anytime we have anything technical or a video production, Liz is, is right front and center. And Liz, please know how grateful I am and the whole team is that we have you and, and all that you do for us. The other two come as, as a combo. It's, it's, such an amazing pair, and that's Bruce and Sue Goldson for all that they do, please. These are the amazing people that every single month when you get a, an email, whether you open it or not, whether you see it or not, but there's an email that's sent on the first of every month, it comes from their desk, and they are our communications chairs for the zone, which is a really, really big position and just know how grateful I am for all that you guys do for, for the zone, for me personally, and I will forever be grateful, so thank you. So, I now have a speech to give. I wanted to, to share with you my, my journey in this, this amazing organization. I've been in Rotary for 23 years. I've been in Rotary longer than I've been not in Rotary in my life. <laughs> Crazy, right? I'm 43, started at 20. So the question always is, how did I get into Rotary at 20? People always want to know, so I'll bring you all the way back to the beginning of how I got into this amazing organization. I got in by being in the right place at the right time. I was just so fortunate and so lucky. I purchased my first property, and it just so happened my next door neighbor was all things the incoming president of the North Rockland Rotary Club. And I had an opportunity to meet this guy, Ron. And Ron was a 35-year-old attorney at the time, and he was in a really vibrant club. Now, his club, for the most part, were members in their 60s. They were diverse at the time from a, from a gender perspective. I'd say about half women, half men. But Ron had this really vibrant club that he realized that if something didn't change, what would ultimately happen, right? So he was on this mission to, to get younger and get younger quick. What happens? I, this kid moves in next door. And we start a, an early friendship, and he said to me, he said, would you come to my Rotary meeting? Now, outside of Ron asking this question, I never faced Rotary before. I had no idea what it was, what it did, outside of maybe seeing the wheel on the side of the road. This was my first opportunity to even hear about Rotary. So I did what I thought was the natural thing. I asked, what is Rotary? And it's the answer that this man gave that I think still holds true today, because he said, don't worry about what it is. You show up this Thursday, and I'm going to introduce you to all the movers and shakers of our community. Now, just starting my professional career as a banker, how could I possibly say no to the opportunity to meet all these people he's claiming are in our community, the movers and shakers? So that Thursday, I went to my first Rotary meeting, and Ron held up his end of the bargain, because I walked through that door, and sure enough, I had the who's who of my town sitting right there. I had a Supreme Court judge, I had the town clerk, I had the mayor, vice president of the local bank, you name it, they were there. But it's what happened when I walked through that door that will forever have changed my life. Because I wasn't introduced to them by their titles or what they did, I was introduced to Gary and Bud and Bill and Emily. And I thought that was so amazing that here it is, I'm a kid, 20 years old, I have no business whatsoever sitting across from any of these people, and they saw me as an equal. And that's what Rotary is, because regardless of how much money you have or any of these things, you walk through that door 
We're all Rotarians. And I thought it was so amazing to possibly be part of an organization like this. I'm in. And I was very fortunate that, that they took a liking to me and provided me this amazing platform. And I spent the better part of, if you will, my rotary career trying to find ways to show how our organization is relevant to all demographics, but specifically the demographic in which I think I'm still in, but that's a young professional. I'm probably moving away from that. But what can we do? What can we show? What value proposition can we give to tell these people how amazing we are and have them see what I see? And there's the professional development, there's leadership development, there's networking, there's all the things that we talk about, but I think the thing that's overlooked quite often is the mentorship. Because to me, our number one asset, hands down, is our members. It's you. You are our asset. And I think we overlook me mentorship in multiple ways because, yes, it's very much so that the young could be mentored by the old, and I don't mean it from a generational perspective, but it goes the other way as well. Because there's so much our younger demographics bring into the organization and bring to our members. So let me share what I would think is an untraditional mentorship story. And I've got a lot of stories in, the, in this organization, but I want to tell you one about something I was trying to do for year after year after year and just did not have success. Anyone in the room ever tried to tie a bow tie? I'm talking a real bow tie, right? Not the clip, right? I'm hands raised. Well, I forever was trying to do this. And I will tell you, I put on a bow tie more often than not for a rotary event, right? How many black tie events do we get invited to, do we have? And every time I would take my James Bond black bow tie out, I'd put it on, or I'd try to put it on, and I'd have my phone right in front of me, and I'd have YouTube on. And I would try to find the tutorial to teach me how to tie this bow tie. And I'd usually start about an hour before we were supposed to leave for the event. And I would try... I would try, and then about the half hour mark, the sweat would start beating down the side of my face, and I'd keep going, and finally, about five minutes to having to leave, I throw it down, I say I give up, and I put the clip on, on, and off I go. This happened for years. Now, in my training to be governor, we have an opportunity to, to go to training year after year, and there was a governor who came the year before me who was one of these dapper-looking guys, wore the bow tie every day, right? Regardless of the event, he'd be in a bow tie. And I'm like, this guy looks amazing. What are the odds that he would possibly show me how to tie a bow tie? So sure enough, of all places, I am in Vancouver. We're at a hotel for one of these training events, and we've never connected, but I catch this guy, Dwight, in the bathroom. And Dwight finishes up, and here it is. I turn to him, and I said, Dwight, you, you don't know me. He goes, no, no, I know who you are. I mean, I kind of stick out like a sore thumb at times because just I look a little bit different than the contemporary of this group. He said, what can I do for you? I said, listen, your bow tie is absolutely amazing. I've got a request of you. Is there any way you can show me one day how to tie it? Now, what does this man do? True rotary fashion, pulls it right off his neck. <laughs> Two men in the bathroom. He comes behind me, father-son moment, right? and teaches me how to tie a bow tie, right? Now, let me tell you how it comes completely full circle. This man gives me this, and now forever I know how to tie a bow tie. This past season, I, I should say this past pet season, I'm making my rounds, going to different pets, and I had a local pet that one of my sons, my, my middle son, who is 11 years old, asked if he can go, and it, he wasn't missing any school, and the boys travel, we have two little ones, quite often with us, but usually with pets and conferences, we come in, we come out, they don't come. So Jackson wanted to come, no problem. And I was giving the bow tie talk, I think, that night. And I was wearing my own. And he said, Dad, can I wear a bow tie? And I said, sure. And I only had the one, the extra one that I had was the one you had to make. So there it was. I was around my son's neck teaching him how to tie a bow tie. All because of this man, right? These are the mentorship opportunities that we just don't think. And, and that's a fun one, but there's a thousand of them that I've had over the years, both professionally, but more personally. All the different conversations I've had with Rotarians who've guided my life just in basic conversation. This is the asset we have. And while we're always trying to engage our youth, our young professionals, I think we have to be extremely mindful of being, as I noted before, relevant to all demographics. How do we bring in the recently retired? 
How do we bring in the working person? And when we think of that concept, I really believe the core value of all is people want to feel welcome. They want to feel like they belong. You take it even a couple years ago with the great President Jennifer would talk about the comfort and care of our members. Look at Gordon this year talking about mental health and specifically mental health of our members. Or next year when incoming President Stephanie is going to talk about belonging. It's all the same core feeling of how do we make our members feel special. So let me tell you how, how I had an opportunity to feel special. And when I tell you to feel special, I get to do this. I get to go around, if you will, the, if you would, the world and have people be all excited to see me. So if there's ever someone who feels special in this organization, I'm the poster child. But one January, I get a phone call from a fellow member in my Rotary Club. Her name is Judy. Judy reaches out, who, member, I can't say I'm friends with her. I mean, we're acquaintances. And I said, hey, Judy, what's up? How can I help you? She said, you have a birthday this month. I said, I do have a birthday this month. She said, we really would like you to come to one of our meetings. She goes, you haven't been coming lately. We want you to celebrate your birthday with us. I said, well, Judy, that's really sweet that you reached out. Obviously, you know, I do a bit of travel specifically for Rotary. You know, sorry I haven't been there. She goes, we want you to come so much, I will, I will bake you a birthday cake. I said, yeah. I said, you don't have to. She goes, no, no, no. I want to bake you a cake. She goes, what kind of cake do you like? I said, well, if you're asking, I like chocolate cake. She said, okay, I can make a chocolate cake. Okay. She said, is there anything you want with your chocolate cake? And I guess I just couldn't leave it there. I said, well, if I'm having chocolate cake, I want vanilla ice cream. She goes, how do you have chocolate cake without vanilla ice cream, right? She said, no problem. You come for your birthday. There'll be chocolate cake and vanilla ice cream. So weeks go by. I show up to my club, right? I got to tell you, the feeling I had that my members of my club were so excited to see me and celebrate my birthday with me, that was like one of the greatest moments I had. So we had a good meeting, and, and I learned at that meeting that Judy's birthday was in February. So I did what I thought was the natural thing. I turned to Judy, and I said, hey, Judy, I hear you have a birthday in February. What type of cake do you like? I like vanilla cake. I said, oh, I can do vanilla cake. I said, is there anything you want with yours? She goes, nope, I'm basic, just vanilla. I said, okay. And sure enough, weeks later, I show back up with the club, to the club with a vanilla cake in hand. I tell you this story because here it is, like I said, I feel welcome everywhere I go. But one member reached out to me, and now I'm in my meeting twice in a month because she made me feel special. How many members do we currently have that just aren't around anymore? Are we looking around and seeing where the person went? It could be for all the best reasons. They could be on vacation. They could be visiting a child. Or it could be for difficult reasons. They're struggling financially. They're struggling physically. We're family. We should always be there for our fellow Rotarians because if we do engage them in that way, they're with us for life, right? And then they're passing it forward because we all want that feeling. That's a responsibility from my perspective of all of us to reach out and make sure our fellow members feel that warmth, feel that belonging. So I've shared a couple stories with you tonight, and I was given the gift of Rotary by Ron. Right? This man, who has a couple more grays on his hair than he did when he, he first asked the question, gave me this magical gift that he could have never known from asking that one simple question that it would change my life and change my entire family's life 23 years ago. But he gave it to me, and I am grateful and thankful every day because really I stand before you, he and this organization made me the man I am today. Right? I credit so much because of Rotary and what it's done and the opportunities it, it's presented. Every one of you who sit in this room who are part of this Rotary family, I have to think was asked by somebody to be part of this. You were given the gift of Rotary. My call to action is for all of us to be Iran. Who do we know, whether it's our partner, our colleagues, our friends, our children? Why wouldn't you want them to be part of us? Why wouldn't you want to give them this incredible gift we call Rotary, this movement? If you have a passion, we have an outlet for you. We all know this. And I think that's something we, we really need to focus on and, and share our story and tell people and invite people to be part of us. 
so tonight I, I, I would like to close with what I consider my successes in this organization. So Kim, when, when she was kind enough to introduce me, talked about some of the statistics, right? I, I, you could say my success was that I joined at 20 or that I was a club president young or I was district governor at 32 or even you could say my success is that I hold the title of director at such a young age or that I just hold the title of director. That's not my success. I want to share my success with you. My success is that my partner, my wife, is a fellow Rotarian. And when I tell you she is the most supportive partner, and, and let me just pause for a moment and, and just say thank you to all the partners, if they're in the room or they've allowed you to be in this room and they're at home holding down the fort, we are so blessed to have partners that are supportive of us. And I have one of those. So my partner, who is now a Rotarian for over 10 years, is the past president of her Rotary Club. She's a past assistant governor and a huge supporter of this organization. That's my success. My success is that my now 22-year-old daughter did her sophomore year of high school in Rome, Italy for a Rotary Youth Exchange. My success, let me tell you about my now 21-year-old son, right? So I was at this convention back in May. You might have heard about it. It was in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> and at the first lunch, which you might have heard the person who ran that lunch, but at this lunch, I happened to be sitting next to the sitting governor of Charlotte, North Carolina. And as you do at all these tables, obviously you, you make small talk, and traditionally when I'm making small talk, I, I start talking family, because it's the easiest thing, I think, to, to talk about. Most people have or want to talk about it. And we were going through how many kids he has, how many kids I have, and we, we landed on the fact that I have a son that just moved to the Charlotte area of North Carolina. He, and that's when he told me, because up until that point I didn't realize he was the governor of Charlotte, North Carolina. He said, oh, get out of here, that's where I'm from. I said, oh, that's awesome. He says, well, what does your son do? I said, well, he's a software developer. He said, no. He goes, I'm a software developer. I said, what are the odds? So we had a nice lunch, and at the conclusion of lunch, he, he turns to me and he said, listen, if I could help you, your son, in any way, please know, here's my information, have him give me a call, I know you have no family down there, in true rotary fashion, if you need something, I'm literally a phone call away. I said, no, Cam, I really appreciate that, that offer, I'm gonna pass along to my son. So, what do I do next, try to be a good dad? I give a text to my son, I say, hey Joe, just met this awesome guy, he's in software development like you are, he's in Charlotte, why don't you just drop him a line, it seems really cool. So my son responds back, okay, dad, I'll do that. Now, that never happens, but this time <laughs> he went with it. But I expected it to truly just kind of end there, right? So I get a text a couple days later. He said, hey, I reached out to Cam. He's actually not going to be in the States for a couple weeks because I already knew he's going to New Zealand. But when he gets back, we're going to do lunch. Okay, great. Leave it there. A couple weeks go by. I get a text not from my son but from Cam. It's a selfie of the two of them having lunch. So I then get a call from my son, and I say I couldn't talk to him. We connect a couple hours later. I said, Joe, what's up? And I already knew what's up. He said, oh, I had this great lunch today. I said, oh, did you? He said, yeah. He goes, I met with your, your friend Cam. I said, yeah. He goes, oh, it was just really an exciting lunch. I said, why was it so exciting? He goes, Dad, he was talking about Rotary. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. He said, Dad, do you know you could network in Rotary? <laughs> now, when I tell you this kid has sat through a thousand speeches, you know. I said, oh yeah, Joe, you can network. Yeah, Dad. He said, and I could bring my friends into this thing. I said, get out of here. <laughs> Never a profit in your own land, huh? So at that moment, I, I, I told him two things. I said, Joe, listen, you, you have to understand, if you become part of this thing, that is absolutely awesome, but you need to have the space that if you walk in and it's not for you, you get out as fast as you got in, you don't owe your mom and I anything to be in this organization. I said, and two, listen, right now I, I have some privilege in this organization. Some folks might know me. I would be so proud coming down as just your father. If you want the card to be out there of, of my position right now, happy to do it. No, dad, totally want you to come as, as what you are. Okay. Friends, my success is that I had the opportunity to put the pin on my son who became a member of this amazing organization at the age of 20 years old. 
My success is that my 19-year-old daughter gets her, her service through Rotary, that she's out there on most Saturday nights with my wife feeding the homeless. That's my success. Let me tell you about our, our, our two little ones, Jackson and Brandon. So we receive a phone call right after COVID lifted. Kids got back to school. We get a phone call from the principal of my son's elementary school. Now, third grade at the time. I remember when I was in third grade, if there was a call home from the principal, that was not going to be a good night. That's not what this call was. My wife picks up the phone. Principal was all excited to, to tell her, Jackson made an appointment and came to my office today. And he was so excited to talk about this thing called Early Act. And the principal had no idea what Early Act was. We didn't have any idea that Jackson had any idea what Early Act was. We barely knew what Early Act was. And she said, I, I had no idea that this program existed. And he told me all, you know, that it's the Rotary. And the principal asked my son, what is Rotary, right? He spent 10 minutes up and down how amazing this organization is, right? And she said to him, I really want to do this with you. Take the summer, figure all this out, come back in the fall, and if you come back, we will find a way to start Early Act in our elementary school. So Jackson spent the summer, downloaded every PDF you could possibly think of from every district that has this program, probably in the world. In September hit, he was back in her, her office asking if he could start an Early Act club. My success, I will tell you, one of the greatest feelings I've ever had as a Rotarian and as a father was when that flyer came home in his folder that had the mark of excellence, our rotary wheel on top, and it said Early Act right next to it. My success is my son started an Early Act club that now has 40 members. He's the president, and his brother Brandon is the vice president. Friends, my success is that I've had this absolutely amazing organization provide me and my entire family these opportunities. I leave you tonight by asking you, what will your success be? Thank you.